judges, and then we spoke a little bit about what it is to make righteous judgments. Okay? Remind me, what's a righteous judgment? <laughs> According to God's instruction, right? It is not me judging you, telling you what God said about your situation. It's very simple. God said, if you do this, then this will happen. That's not me judging, that's me telling you what's coming. Okay? So if you act in a certain way, I'm telling you what Abba said. Whether you believe he is God or not, you will soon find out. Okay? You will see your fruit. You will see what he says. And we can't run around perverting that. Because this portion is for people who are supposed to be judging Israel, helping them, guiding them. That's what a judge is supposed to do. Okay, we've got into this whole idea. Remember, I spoke a bit about it. Don't judge me. Mm. Judge not, and you will not be judged. As Yeshua wasn't saying again, don't use Torah. He was saying, check yourself before you start talking to people. Okay? Doesn't help you pretend to be all righteous and a complete sadiq, and you're walking around, and then he says, oh no, you know, you need to really fix up your life when your life's a mess. Why don't you look, ask God to help you in your house fix up your story before you start giving counsel to others? If you were actually living by Torah, then maybe your situation wouldn't be so bad. Now, is it fair to say that because you're going through a difficult time that you're not living by Torah? No. Absolutely not. Because Abba said, and because the disciples said, you're going to go through tests and he's going to. He's going to work with you, he's going to show you stuff about yourself, and he's going to get rid of that chach, amen, amen, so that you can be something new. Here's the kicker. You have to believe. If I were to ask you guys, how many of you believe, those of you who have been baptized, who have made the choice, completely rededicated, how many of you believe that you are a new creation? Hands up. How many of you are still struggling with the idea? Okay? It's amazing how this, 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 this crossing over thing happens. You know what happens? You become from old creation, didn't really follow God, didn't really understand Him, kind of lived in my life, and then I become what's called a baby Christian, or a scripture which is a fleshly Christian. Okay? These are the people who, how, how do I put it? And this is not meant to be offensive, okay? If this is you, smile, I was there as well, okay? Don't beat yourself up to bed. But when I look at a toddler, and if I find out that when you don't get X, Y, and Z, what happens when a toddler doesn't get his way? Go away. Right. And grumbling and moaning, and you don't love me, and you don't love me. And what happens sometimes when, 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 it's, it's funny because adults do this more than what they care to admit. <laughs> yeah. When you go through this process of, I, I call it the triangle. Okay, people who know my situation will understand. If you're tired, hungry, or cold. Uh, then that toddler comes up. <laughs> if you are not physically comfortable, then you cannot be spiritually loving. It's time to move forward. You can learn to be. In your discomfort, you press. Okay? We, we, need to, we need to learn to make this link, and this is what kids, 
I suppose, and, and, and as, as we go through the stages, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome that God has given us, given us these, these physical stages in, in our life that we can look back and you can sort of identify. This only really struck me when I became a parent. When you're looking around and you can see the stages in, in, in each, as your child grows and you're thinking, wow, you know, that's amazing. They didn't do that last time, but you know, now they're doing this. And anybody of you know will be like, oh, it's so cute. Then it turns to, <laughs> then it becomes a little bit more mm. niggly. Mm. And then, I don't care what you say about the terrible twos, the terrible threes are worse. <laughs> now they really learn to stamp their feet and they have their wobbles about a whole bunch of stuff. And then they start going and they start to settle down in five or six, seven, they say six and seven, there's a little bit of a terrible three moment where they're adjusting to their emotions and how to cope and how to deal with certain things and you know, all of a sudden their minds are awakening to, to certain things that we take for granted. And then they settle down again until you get to about 15, 16, 17. <laughs> they say 13 it starts, but the 16, 17 part is when things start to get fun. 36. <laughs> <laughs> Except they okay, managed to be outside again tonight. I hope you like yourself. Right. For those of you who don't know, I'm writing, a, I'm writing a manual on what good husbands should not say. That's number 400. <laughs> Things not to say to get myself into trouble. Man, it's going to be the longest. It's going to be the longest book in the history of Britain. Because as I will well stipulate in page number one, ladies, pay attention. Men are stupid. <laughs> we like to run into walls before we realize that it's not a good thing for me to say X, Y, and Z. Of the opinion, that you are too different. Ah, so you're out of it. So you go through this process, guys, and you learn and you know how to deal with it, and Abba shows you, right? Just like a good father and mother should. They start teaching you consequences and responsibility and, you know, that's where pocket money and those sort of things come in and you go through this whole process and you, you get to where you should be. Hopefully, God willing, as a fully functioning, well-adjusted adult. What's that? You know? We smile. <laughs> Some people never got past the 16-year-old stage. Alright? But as a new believer, you go through this process of, I feel the same, but something's different inside of me. Something I used to maybe struggle with a little bit before, like reading my Bible, is now something I rather enjoy. There's a bit of a transformation that takes place. All of a sudden, praying was something that I felt forced to do. Maybe now I actually want to. And it's little adjustments. And you slowly start to grow. And you slowly start, the more you press into, if God is real and I've given my life to Him, then I need to start to. <coughs> Notice there's a nice if in the middle. You alone will control how much you change. Mm. You know why? Because you don't want to let go of you. Mm. You hold on to your situation, your wants, your desires, how you want to do things, and it's created a mess before, and yet you want to do it again. But now you're a Christian, so things are going to be different. No. Lay down your cross and follow me means that I let go of self. Everything that I wanted, how I wanted to do, my desires. My plans in life were to, I shared this before, you know, own my own business. Suit, tie, aircon, office, business analyst, blah, 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 mass, lots of money and things, and, you know, married and kids were sort of on the backdrop. I'm now what you call a glorified lip mechanic. I make gutters and industrial things and all types of fun stuff. And I promise you, the way God has changed me, I am so happy where I am right now because when I look back and I think, yo, oh, Sitting in the office looking at numbers all day would have been boring. <laughs> That's just me. If you do that every day and you're happy, awesome. But I, need, I, get, I get the blessing of going out to different sites. I get to go and see 
you know, we, we, we drop off stuff and you get, you know, we did work at Orlando Stadium and you go look at um, Crusader Power Station and I've literally seen that thing go up as you've been doing work there and you're going stuff and you're just like, oh, you know, this is, I can actually see what, where, where the stuff we're making is going and it's exciting. But that just pays the bills. Where I am, what defines me is not my job. It's my calling. God gave you a name and he said this is who you are to be. We call that a gift. We're still sitting, sometimes we sit and we struggle on the, on the stuff that we think we need to be or how we need to act or how this is going to work out. Instead of looking to God who you gave your life to because now it's his plan, now it's his way. And you slowly look to him and you're saying, Allah, I don't know what to do here, you're going to have to show me. I know what I want to do, but I don't know if that's right. And instead, actually asking the question, you put me here, why am I here? Um, if you two don't mind, I'll use your example a little bit of the word. Chris who leaves, you know, goes through a very difficult time, in and out of work, all over the place, and now he's working in La La Land, I don't know, no? <laughs> and he comes home, what's it, every second week? Maybe. More or less. Okay? And all of a sudden we have from close family unit to one big chunk missing. And I guarantee you, I haven't spoken to them about this, this is not pre-planned, that there's been more than one occasion where both of them, and I'm sure the kiddies as well as, what are you doing? I mean... I thought husbands were supposed to be here. I thought my daddy was supposed to be here. How are you supposed to be helping me with this? Abba, what's going on? And Daddy's sitting there by his insum, sitting over there, all of a sudden being removed from a fellowship to now sitting with a bunch of very wise, very old men having a small group Bible study where Christu went from being one of the oldest members in our fellowship to being the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're sitting there and you're going, what are you doing? And I bet you the struggle is with everybody is that we want to pick it up and we want to go, no, 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 the steering wheel is just supposed to be going this way. It's supposed to be about my comfort. I'm supposed to be sitting happily at home. I'm supposed to be in this situation. And I was going, but I'm not done fixing you yet. That's right. You want to come into your fruition of what God has planned for you, fix you first. And this is how we do it. All right, let me, let me do it this way. This is how not we do it. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to sort this out, and once that's done, it's boom. If you could fix you, you would have. You can't. This is how you do it. God shows you something. Maybe you have one of those cold, tired, hungry moments, and the stuff that you thought the person you're not comes out. Yeah. I'm not so mean and vindictive and judgmental. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to need some work in progress. Maybe I need some help. When that stuff comes out, I don't know whether it's your road rage, whether it's your circumstance, whatever he uses to squeeze the toothpaste to see what's coming out on the inside. God knows how to push buttons, and our Satan does as well. Eh? When he pushes the buttons and the ugliness comes, or the doubt comes, or the fear comes, or the angst comes, or the anxiety, or the hopelessness, or whatever it is that he's showing that you have inside you, I want you to go up to Abba and say, this is what I see. I know this is not of you. I'm giving it to you so you can take that away. Do not justify your response. Do not sit there and pat yourself on the back of what's because of you, or you did this, or because of my situation. No, this is all you. If you justify, then you shift, shifting the blame. It is my circumstances that made me lose my temper. It is because I don't know what's going on that made me lose hope. Oh, well, it's just because I was having a bad day and I was tired, so I wasn't paying attention. 
or maybe it's your desires or what you want or what you think is going to fool you. I promise you now, and I'm, people who have done this for a little while before, stick up your hand if you have known that something that you thought, something that you really desired with all your heart was going to sort out your life and make everything better was exactly the opposite of what was good for you. <laughs> Young ones, we've been stupid lots, have <laughs> take, take a page from people that have run into a couple of walls before you. You don't have to make the same mistakes. You don't have to make a golden cough. We know that God doesn't like golden cough. So please, if you want to be a jeweler, stay away from the earring motif, okay? <laughs> don't go into your bondage. Don't try and create your own God. Don't try to do it your own way. We're learning from people that have done this, and we grow. We get to sidestep the thing, because we've seen what happens when you do that. But your belief in what God is doing in you, you see, Hasatan's going to tell you how useless you are, how broken you are, how you're not everything that God calls you. And you have to turn around and you have to say, but God has made me, He's made me a new creation, He's made me a judge, He's made me a kohen, He's made me whatever He's called me to be. Don't think that you're the only one that's ever doubted their calling. I can give you a string of names as long as my arm about people that argued with God about who they were. One that really makes me smile is Gideon. A threshing floor is something that sits on top of a hill generally. Okay? So you'll have a, a highish hill and then you'll have a threshing floor that's sort of here. Okay? It's a little basin. You sort of go in there and you put in your, you know, you collect all your wheat and all the rest of it. And what you do is you take a winning, winning fork, it's a little fork with two or three prongs. And you would flick up, and the wheat and the stuff, the heavy stuff, the good stuff will fall back down, but the chaff will get blown away. So we separate what is good and what is bad. What I really want, and I get rid of all the other fluffy stuff. As I lift up and I throw and I and I deal with this, now we find Gideon, right? And he's busy doing stuff and he gets this moment and feels the presence of God and God looks at him and goes, Oh, Gideon, mighty man of valor. He was hiding in the threshing floor. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, mighty man, oh, great man of God, you are going to go and conquer. What? <laughs> Obviously got the wrong guy. Why would you be hiding, number one? <laughs> you see, we doubt. We doubt who we are. We doubt what God has already done. We doubt what is going on around us at this point. If God had really already done it, surely this country would have been done. You know, we've got 1.7 million people praying in Bluffertang. We've got people praying all over the world. There's revival, but, you know, it still smells and looks like gold South Africa, so we're not going to hold much of it, right? Or, God's going, you saw what I did for the Lord. You saw the rain that I've poured out. You saw that I got, and let's be honest, Angus Bachan had got people and he said, Soccer City, 90,000 seats. Guess what? We got about 40, 45,000 people there. And that's in a built up area with car guards and comfortable situations, and it's not that far. And you can go sit in a seat for two hours and you can pray and you can do that. And he couldn't even fill the stadium. And then he goes, we're going to go in the middle of nowhere on some random farm where you might have to camp and bring porta potties, but we want a million. <laughs> and me, I went, yo, Angus, I hope you know this is God. But <laughs> Uncle Angus, this is going to be a big <laughs> moment. And Bloemfontein had a spike of tourism <laughs> to the point where the airports were full. They, they had helicopters flying onto the farm. I mean, please, this is South Africa. We are so busy about our own lives, doing our own thing, you to struggle to get anybody to march for anything. And you get, like, over a million people sitting on some random person's farm praying for revival. And in its own self, it's a lyric. So we saw what he did with the wall. We saw what he did in Blue Dead, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he's going to do next. But we have our part to play. 
We have to stand up and take ownership for what we're doing. We have to do the change. Because what's the point of the flood? What's the point of the rain? What's the point of Bloemfontein if you don't change? You want your marriage to work? If what's going on in your life, if it's not working right now, change something. Who would have thought doing the same thing over and over again does not bring the same results? Reading my Bible once a week will not help me grow. I don't know why. So I'm going to pray hard and ask God to supersize my McDonald's Bible verse scripture piece. And then I'm going to be full for longer. Or, you need to step out a little bit. You need to give more of your time. You need to give more of yourself. You need to check yourself to bring that change. And you need to ask God to fix you. To fix us. To fix us. To fix us. Righteous judgments. This is your standard. <clears throat> the standard in my home. The standard for myself. The standard for my children. The standard... When does this become your standard? When does this become your go-to book? When you're having a rough time, when you're, when you're struggling, when you need to grow, when you need to eat, when you need to go from a little baby two to three months and we start to get growing, get bigger and we grow some more. How are we going to get there? Well, I promise you, if you don't feed baby, he's not going to be happy. Number one, number two, he's probably not going to make it. Shock and horror. If you do not feed yourself, you will probably die. <laughs> Who knew? We do not need doctors to tell us this. Skip one or two meals, most of you will feel like you're dying. <laughs> Fasting is something that happens in Old Testament, and we don't like to talk about it. Until Yom Kippur comes and then someone tells me oh, I have to skip meals. You are your mind. I have low blood sugar. <laughs> no, you're, you're just not used to skipping anything. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, but it gets you to focus on him. But if you do not feed Baba, if you do not feed you, if you do not hold on, cling to, ask him to show you what's going on, you can only break. Can you imagine God calling up judges and he's saying, all right, now you, you are going to teach my people. I want you to go out and investigate things. I want you to go and talk about things. I want you to do that. Don't worry, the kochen, the kochen him are there. There's priests out there with you. But we're going to form a, a group of you. Remember, this is a big, well, you could say it's almost a judicial panel type of thing. 70, 70 Sanhedrin, 70 members. But don't negate the fact there were leaders of 10, leaders of 50, leaders of 100, leaders of 1,000. And you still had the priest, now you've got a Sanhedrin. And you have to take ownership for your fellow men, and you have to help them and guide them and lead them. How many of you see stuff, things going on in your house, and you see someone about to run into a wall, and you take a step to the side? Wrong heart. <laughs> Top 10 things not to do to your husband. <laughs> if I love them, I step in the way and say, Stop, do you realize what you do? They can shout at you, they can monitor you, they can be disgruntled with you, but I promise you, when they look back, they will thank you. What God challenges you with is how well do you take instruction? Oh, we push the button there. <laughs> you see, this is all about instruction. But if you don't understand where it's coming from, it means nothing to you. Why? Because you think it's a list of do's and don'ts, or otherwise you get the belt. Mm. Or, a loving father who knows everything about everything, because he created it, mm. looks at you, this beautiful child whom he called, whom he created, placed you in a specific family, maybe placed you in your family, gave you family, gave you wife, whatever your situation is. And he looks at you and he goes, you know what, this is going to help you. Just, just 
these are things that I've seen. This is going to hurt you, and this is going to bring you peace. And this is not only going to bring you peace, but it's going to bring your family peace. And it's not only going to bring your family peace, it's going to teach your children. And it's not only going to teach your children because it's going to come up, it's going to teach your grandchildren. All because of a standard you choose for yourself. And I love you that much that I've written it down so that you can go investigate it. You can study it and you can look at it. So when your heart, when your emotions, when your grumpy pants tells you something else... Maybe look down at those funny tassels that we make, that, that we ask you to wear, and you go, all right, how about that sit sit thing? This is to remind me what he said. And then I stop and I make an informed decision and go, you know what, I'm in a bad space right now, maybe I shouldn't just jump in this. Maybe stop and look at what you're doing and seeing the fruit of what you, what you want to do and what you're pushing for, if it is bringing destruction. If this is what Israel is being called to be, surely you must know what is good and what is not. And if it is, surely you must be able to choose what is good instead of what is not. See, I can write down here, don't stick your fingers in the car, don't let your friend slam it. <laughs> How many people out there will think we'll try and test it? How many screw fingers do we need, really, to understand that maybe God knew what he was talking about? You see, he's not only molding you, he's not only establishing you, he's not only building you up and changing who you are, but he wants you to be aligned to everything so that you can actually, when I look into your life, I see fruit because God is there. If you look in your life and you see strife and you see ugliness and you see meanness and you see brokenness and you see fear and you see hopelessness and you see... Maybe you're feeding the wrong thing. Maybe you're not clinging to God and maybe you're clinging to yourself. Take stock. He either is God or he isn't. Believers believe. Disciples follow. Decide this day what you want to be. I love you all madly, but if you feel that this is too much for you, maybe you should take a step back and ask Abba what you want you to be. See, I don't believe in the whole thing of making a big packed church and everybody coming there and me spoon feeding you and thinking everything's going to be alright and I give you a pep talk and you go home and you feel good about yourself, but nothing changes. <laughs> I believe Abba is establishing something that has been lost for a long, 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 long time. We read what God said to establish what He said, so I'm going to push you into what He said so you can follow Him. And if you're not, what are you? You see, Scripture says, you know, the Indians and the Hasatan know God is God. They believe in Him too. What's the difference between you and Him? One says, I'm going to follow you, and you are my King, and I'm going to walk with you. And I've given up my life to walk with you. And the other one says, how can you deal with all of these bunch of grumpy, useless, good-for-nothing people who don't praise you, they look at you, all they do is kick each other around, shout at each other, moan at each other, do whatever they want to do, how they want to do it, and then they justify it, and then they tell you that they believe in you. He's called the great accuser for a reason. How's it about you give him less to work with? How's it about you make a decision? Say, no matter what the cost, whether it pleases my family, pleases my dog, pleases my friends, pleases my boyfriend, my girlfriend, whatever. And why don't you start asking the question, Abba, if it pleases you? 
And in doing that, I'm not saying take, take your spouse and kick them to the curb. I'm saying that if you really love God and if you really get stuck into His Word, it will make you a better husband because He says, build up your spouse. And I'm loving her because I love Him. And when they're not having a good time and they're dealing with their stuff and they're grumbling and moaning, I go to Him and I say, Abba, they're hurting and they're struggling. I need your help. Help her. She's struggling. Help him. He's stressing. Am I going to add gasoline to that? Or am I going to come in and I'm going to say, come on. You know God's got this. You know He's here. I know it's difficult and I know it's uncomfortable. But God has got us here for a reason. Let's move forward. What do we say in a marriage day three? Right, grooming her. In any relationship, you and Abba, that's the majority, that's all you should care about. If you have someone telling you to dishonor your parents, telling you to go against the will of God, telling you to do that, where is that voice coming from? Is it what they want? So they can get what they want, and they can get what they want from you? And to heck with all the destruction you leave behind. They don't have to worry about that, but one day you're going to have to face it. How many of you have seen the destruction of families being ripped apart because of one person's bad decision? You don't have to look for us. Some of us live it. But you can stop and you can take stock and you can change and you can fight to move forward because you will not let that happen to your family. You will fight to make the right decisions. You will fight for yourself. You know, God believes in you so much that He died to have you. Why do you treat yourself like dirt? If you feed yourself rubbish all the time, you're going to feel rubbish. If you believe you're rubbish, you're going to act like you're rubbish. The reason you're struggling is because you don't know who you are. I know who God says you are, but you need to start believing who you are. You want to be a husband? Act like it. The way he said. You want to be a wife? Act like it. You want to be a son or a daughter? Act like it. But above all, understand one thing. You are a son to him first. You are a daughter to him first. And people should look into your life and they should go, Wow, this church thing or this... Believers thing or this whatever movement this is, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. But people should look into your life and they go, wow, you know what? The divorce rate in this group is minuscule. Why? Their families work. Why? You know, these guys are hard workers, man. Why? You know, there's... It's not always easy, but there's this respect between elders and those younger. You know, it's funny. When I grew up, you know, my father was always like, you walk to the cafe, and if you... The uncle behind the, 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 the counter says, hello, son, you said, hello, woman. Now you get people in families that you know. I, 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 I see this in... And my brother's side, they're kids, they're five, six years old, walk up to the grandparents and call them by their first name. If I don't even need to call you, who are the rest of these people? You know, God has designed a family, He's put people together, and He's given an establishment, and you're sitting there and you're going, you know what? It's too much of this. Let's do it a little bit here, a little bit there. And, you know, we'll do it a lot on Saturday or Sunday, but then we, when we leave here, we don't take it into our house. <coughs> you're free willingly giving your kids TV, giving your kids whatever they want, to keep them entertained, but you're not giving them God. Kids, what are you going to teach yourself? What are you going to establish in yourself? You know what I learned when I came back? 
When I came back from Israel for the first time, when I was baptized and everybody fell apart, and my family split and they're broken and they told me I was useless and naive and it wasn't going to work, I carried on because I loved God. He became real to me, not because He wasn't real before, but because I never opened my eyes before. He flicked that switch and He changed me and I could not go back. You know, when you walk for it in a little time, you take that for granted. If you prepared the way to get you to a place where you believed in Him so much that you stood in front of a group of witnesses and you gave your life to Him. Why do you want to act like the world thereafter? Why do you want to hurt yourself? <clears throat> Why do you think it's okay to destroy you and everybody else around you because you just don't want to heal what you are to you? Excuses, man, time after time. Justifying why you need to act this way, why your marriage doesn't work out, why you're angry with your spouse, why you're stressed with your job. Why, 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 why? There's only one thing you should be focusing on. If I told you to go take an hour and a half every day and go watch a movie, you would be more than happy. I'll tell you an hour and a half to spend with your God so that you can change and you want to argue. You want to justify. And you want to say, oh, well, there's just not enough time. But you spend two hours playing TV games, you spend two hours shopping, you spend two hours whatever. You will spend two hours arguing to make your point heard. <coughs> Instead of taking five minutes to say, look, I'm frustrated and angry right now. I'm not going to give you the right response. <coughs> then, can we, can we visit this again in an hour or two's time? I'm going to go spend time at home. I need clarity, I need thought, I need, I need Him to help me get over myself, my hurt, so that we can fix our situation. Fix your workplace, fix you. You don't think it's difficult for a sheep to walk after a shepherd and he doesn't know where he's going. All the sheep, all the shepherd tells him, eat, eat that grass. But where's the water? Don't worry about the water. I've got the water. Get the grass. Because where we're going, there's not so much grass, there's only water. If you don't want to do what you're called to do right now, how can you worry about things that are coming? You give your life to God. You have this moment. You have this, come on, surrender. Get, get, get back into it. And then as soon as you come into this whole situation, you negate your responsibility for where you are right now. I tell me studies. I tell me learns. They study not to know, but to emulate, to revere, to lift up. I don't put on sit sit because I want to make myself feel good. Those of you who have had to put them on for the first time know it makes you feel weird. Put them on because I need reminding daily that I have chosen this and I'm not going to give up without a fight. Where's your fight? Yeah, you guys can dig your heels in about <coughs> stuff. You, you shouted at me, I didn't like that, so I just went and scratched your car, and then afterwards, you know, I kicked the dog, and then afterwards I left, and then, ha, 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 I gave you some poison food. Hopefully okay, that doesn't happen, yeah? <laughs> and you will justify your hate, your response, and your anger, and your frustration, and all the rest of it. But you won't fight for the person. What would your marriage look like if instead of fighting with each other, you fought for each other? Why does the fight for each other only have to happen when the person is about to leave? No, we can fix this. Don't leave! Hmm. How's about your relationship with your parents? How's about your relationship with each other? How many of you know each other's names? Yeah, oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, look, welcome. Mishbacha, this is your family, but you don't know their name. What's their favorite color? 
What does the house look like? Oh. Praise God, we're in a new family. Act like it. You think what we do here is easy? It's not. If you want easy, I'm sorry to say, go get a pep talk somewhere else. I will pray hard that you come back. But what we're called to do here is not for sissies. Discipleship is a real deal thing. But it takes a bit of fire. It takes a bit of fight. It takes a little bit of giving. We will fight for all the wrong reasons and we will fight. And we won't fight for the right stuff. We break stuff and then we pray for others to fix it. But we won't fight for that relationship. We won't fight for time with God. We won't fight with whatever. We enjoy our distractions and then we wonder why we are. Oh, I just don't feel God. He just doesn't listen to me. How long have you fought to hear, to hear Him? How have you asked Him? Have you cried out to Him and He said, open up my ears? How about I'm broken? That's about to do it for you. I don't know how many of you have gotten to the point where you just sit down on the floor and you say, oh no, I'm useless, I just need to be changed. How many of you have fought to change because you're so scared of going back to the way you were? and carry you across and you go, oh, okay, don't worry. How about we'll fix everything? And you do nothing. He is your beloved. Why don't you fight for that time with him? I know this group of people, man. You guys fight vehemently when someone tells you you don't need to keep Torah. And you will go have a 45-minute argument and you write letters and talk to and you will send stuff and you will go and you will blast those people. How dare you tell me I don't have to keep Torah? But you don't keep a relationship with God. What's the point of Torah? Mm -hmm. Don't put on your sit sit and tell me you're, you're, you know, you're keeping Torah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keeping Torah is the fruit of my relationship. That's right. It is not the point of my relationship. Mm -hmm. When I sit and I just do all the outer stuff, I want to be there in with Him. And to do that right, that means my family is strong. To do that right means my relationship with Him is established. And when people look at me, they don't go, wow. Balagana. <laughs> we are walking to that house. There was some anger, and there was some frustration, and there was no patience, and there was no loving kindness, and there was no long suffering, and there was nothing. As families on the brink of divorce, the children don't like the parents. This is what's going on over here. And all they can say is, where is up? <laughs> Me, I had those questions before I came into this, this group of people. So what is your relationship telling me? I can be happy out there without knowing it. How are you attracting anybody? How are you going to provoke a Jew to jealousy who has more relationship with God with people because he follows him? Not in many cases they do because they're Jewish. But there's a small group of people. If you tell them they can't keep Torah to the point that you will kill them. Yeah, I've told you this before. We sat at Yad Vashem. There was this guy, old man, sitting in Germany. They hid a Torah scroll in their roof. And he would go up to his daddy and goes, Abba, 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 tonight can we read the Bible? He said, my boy, you're going to get this family killed. We are not allowed to. If they find out that we have one, we're dead. Do you understand? <coughs> he says, but he knew God needed his father to know that he was there, so he, he kept on nagging him. And he nagged him, and he nagged him. He said, daddy, I'll go keep watch. Daddy, you just read it. He came out and he would whip out that Torah scroll at night <coughs> and he would read the very words of God to his family and he would bless them the way he was supposed to and that brought them hope in a time where they were being persecuted unto death because of their faith. And this little six-year-old boy standing watch, knowing that he slipped up his family with death because they were reading God's word. I 
you fight for a relationship with God? And he said he had a moment. He called him, he called him Eddie up. I believe he went to Yeshua. And he was sitting there and he came up to him and he popped up and he started talking to him. And he told him to just keep on pushing. Keep on believing things are going to change. And then we're recording it. He was an old man. He was living in Israel. And he was as orthodox as you can get. Well, he's black hair, whole tooth. But for a person who risked their life at the very mention of reading God's work to be able to go and pray in Jerusalem, holding a Torah and dancing? together, he's provided for you, he's fought for you. What are you doing? Are you walking over the dead body of Christ and saying, yeah, I'll take all of the blessings, but I'm not worried, I'm just on my way to do whatever? <laughs> He still does today, that he still fights for you daily at those moments. But a shepherd who goes in day to day looks after you day in and day out. Does that not take sacrifice on his part? Make sure you've got a roof over your head, make sure that you have orders, make sure that you have a family, make sure that you have a job in a time where people would give their left arm just to have work. And if you don't have work, what are you doing with that time? Do you have enough to sustain you for right now? So that's the essence of Psalm 23. Right now you're safe. Right now you're provided. For. Right now you have blessings all around you. You have to make the choice. You choose to Baruch Hashem, to say, thank you Abba. You choose to spend time with Him. You choose Him every day, every minute of every day. Don't come here with your, we want rain now, please Abba. You don't think when he, Elijah prophesied and he, and he asked God to block the skies up because they were sacrificing children and, and worshipping Baal and all the rest of it. You don't think they were praying for rain? So why did he listen to one righteous against the nation that was crying? What was the difference? He said, three years, Lord, block it up. Let these people see. And they went through hard times because of their sin. And one man stood up and said, you have caused this. You want the blessing, but you don't want the responsibility. To be called a disciple means that you are going to give everything. That you have a passion and you have a desire to fight for a relationship. To study so that you can do. People go to university to do that stuff. I was asking you to walk it out in your house. And if you see the benefit of it at university, it's fine, you know, because when I come out there, I'm going to get a better paid job, and then I'm going to have a longer life, and I'm going to have good hours, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to earn so much, and then I'm going to be comfortable. So why would you fight to go to university and you don't fight to get a son? You sit up and you get into this place where you become so focused on your comfort. That you forget that God is busy showing you. He could have lightning bolted your butt, but He chose not to. <laughs> Let me show them a little bit of drive, and maybe they will realize. Maybe. 
maybe I'll show them a little bit of dry to make my glory be manifest. So when the rains came, and Elijah was sitting on that mountain, and God answered, and lightning fell and consumed that whole offering, and it went up, and he said, now today you choose. Remember the prayer, the same as David. Lord, may they know that today you are God in Israel. There is no other God here. That includes you, by the way. If you're still struggling with Egypt, maybe you should stop trying to be Pharaoh. <laughs> You're not the God of your own life, you know that. 